natural liver coronavirus is circulating in animals, but, they, but which are not yet infected humans. Now, SARS coronavirus epidemic that happened way back in the year 2002-2003, it caused a large scale devastation beginning in originating in China in November 2002. It affected over 8,000 persons and led to almost 8,800 deaths in 26 countries. MERS coronavirus 2012 began in Saudi Arabia with approximately 2,500 cases and 800 deaths. And still it causes some sporadic cases now and then. So on 31st of December 2019, WHO China country office informed of the cases of pneumonia of unknown etiology in Wuhan city in the Hubei province of China. 7th January 2020, uh, 2019, a novel coronavirus was identified as a positive agent by Chinese authorities. The new virus was designated as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, that is SARS coronavirus 2. On 11th February 2020, WHO named the new coronavirus disease as COVID-19. 30th January 2020, uh, WHO declared COVID-19 as a public health emergency of international concern. If we look at this map over here, so what we see that first time this uh, pandemic originated in the Wuhan city in the Hubei province of China. The, the distribution of the COVID-19 cases as of 29th of March 2020 can be seen in this slide. The various countries, areas or territories with COVID-19 cases reported in the last seven days. If we look here, so what we see here is that most of the areas which are darkest blue, so that we can see like North America or the Europe, European countries or Middle East countries, the uh, intensity of these cases is over 10,000 and even uh, at places more than 50,000. In India, if we take a look over here, so what we see is it is ranging somewhere between 101 to 1,000 cases in the past seven days. The total new cases in past 24 hours, that is uh, as it was um, updated on 28th March, so what we see that uh, over uh, 5.7 lakh confirmed cases and over 26,000 deaths were recorded. In Western Pacific region, there were 1 lakh and 1,462 confirmed cases and 3,592 uh, deaths. In the European region, 3 lakh 24,000 and uh, 343 confirmed cases and 18,740 deaths were recorded. In Southeast Asia region, 3,085 confirmed cases and 114 deaths were reported. On the other hand, in Eastern Mediterranean region, 38,000 plus confirmed cases and 2,500 plus deaths in the uh, previous 24 hours. In uh, America's region, if we take a look over there, so what we see is over 1 lakh of the confirmed cases and over 1,485 deaths. In African region too, over 2,800 cases were confirmed and 48 deaths and gradually it seems to be increasing. Globally, as per the WHO, the risk on risk, risk assessment, it is a very high risk. The global data, if we take a look again, so the coronavirus disease outbreak situation, the confirmed cases is uh, 5,75,444. Confirmed deaths uh, are 26,654 and this is the report from the 201 countries and regions or territories. In India, what is the situation? So what we see here is 901 active COVID-2019 cases which were uh, reported and 27 death cases were reported as on 29th of March 2020. Now, the State-wise uh, status if we see in India, so what we see that almost all the states are uh, reporting uh, some or the other numbers of the confirmed uh, COVID positive cases. 
but the lead is uh, taken by Karnataka, Kerala and Maharashtra which have reported the highest number of deaths and highest number of the COVID positive cases in the country. The total number of confirmed cases in India are 1024 as on 29th of March 2020 and 96 deaths, sorry, 27 deaths. The COVID-19 deaths compared India versus Iran, Italy, Korea and Spain. If we look at this graph, so what we see is in India and also in uh, Korea and uh, South Korea, so the status is not so bad, the conditions are not so bad as compared to the other countries like Italy which is peaking, thereafter followed by Spain and then followed by Iran. Now what is the mode of transmission that, that means how does the disease spread? Now there are two theories, it might be spreading from animal to humans or human to humans. But the understanding of this mode of transmission is still uh, not complete. So based on whatever evidence is available from the earlier experience from China and the other countries, so the animal to human transmission, initially the association with the seafood market was noticed. Uh, then thereafter the seafood market also sold uh, live rabbits, snakes and other animals. The initial concept was that the virus originated from the snakes, but later the studies proved that it had more similarity with the bats. Uh, on the genetic makeup and also with that of the pangolins probably. The human to human transmission that, that really seems to be the predominant mode of transmission. As the out, outbreak progressed, person to person transmission through droplets and fomites became the primary mode of transmission. The incubation period is presumed to be ranging from 2 to 14 days after the exposure and the median period being 5 days after the exposure. Coronavirus can live in the patients for five weeks after being infected. The highest uh, number that, that has been recorded so far is 37 days that is reported. Now, coronavirus transmissibility, if we take a look at uh, that, so infected droplets which are larger than five micrometers can travel only up to about uh, less than one meter. But the aerosols uh, because of certain procedures also might be generated like for example bronchoscopy. If in general the coronavirus, a new coronavirus, it's, uh, the particle size is less than 5 micron uh, millimeter. So then in that case it can travel up to more than 1 meter that would be in the form of the aerosols which is generally lesser, seen, seen to be a lesser condition. But the other mode of transmission can be contact both direct and indirect. Now how does this transmission take place? The droplets. Infected patient when he or she coughs, sneezes or talks, the virus is released into the respiratory secretions as droplets. These droplets can infect the others if they come in direct contact with the mucous membranes. The droplets typically do not travel distance more than 6 feet. Also, those do not linger on in the air and hence there are lesser chances of being this, this particular in, uh, transmission being airborne or being droplet uh, uh, nuclei. Patients are most contagious when they are symptomatic. Now, what is the life of the virus on the various surfaces? It has been noticed that in the air it can survive up to three hours. On the copper utensils or copper surfaces, the life of the virus can be up to four hours. On the cardboard boxes, it can be up to 24 hours. On stainless steel, it could survive up to 2 to 3 days. And on the plastics too, it could survive up to 3 days. The various other modes of transmission also have been looked at. The contact with the contaminated surfaces or the objects. On touching the surface, object having the virus on it and thereafter, touching the mouth, nose or eyes can also lead to the transmission of the virus. Now, fecal oral route of transmission a probability is there, it has been seen that it can survive in the guts, but the exact evidence is not yet there of its transmissibility by the fecal oral route. Can it be passed on through a transplacental route? There are two instances of the neonates being affected, one in China and one in London, but still the exact whether it was before the birth, uh, these neonates contracted the disease or after the birth, that is not yet clear.
So more evidence is needed in this direction. Similarly, transmission through the breast milk that too needs more research. Now, COVID-19, how fatal is this condition? So it looks a lot similar to the seasonal flu than to previous coronavirus, coronavirus outbreaks. If we look at uh, this table, so what we see coronavirus 19, the fatality is about 3.4%, where, whereas in case of seasonal flu, it is 0.1%, in SARS, 10%, and in case of Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, up to 30, 34%. What is the case fatality? as compared to the other epidemics. So if we compare with seasonal flu and measles, we see that coronavirus uh, fatality is much higher, that is 3.4%. But as compared to SARS, smallpox, MERS or Ebola, it seems to be much, much less deadlier. How contagious or fatal it is? So the contagious part of it can be indicated through R0 which is a basic reproduction number. It is a mathematical term that indicates how many people each infected person will in turn infect in a fully susceptible population. So the R0 for various epidemics as compared to COVID if we look at that, so that would be for COVID-19 it is 2.8. That means one infected individual could infect up to 2.8, that is up to three individuals in turn who in turn could infect another three individuals. For seasonal flu, the R0 would be 1.3, for influenza 1.5, for SARS 2 to 5, on an average that could be uh, about 3, for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome 0.8, for measles up to 15. The case fatality for COVID-19 is 3.4 and earlier as discussed, for MERS it could be up to 35%. Now, what are the clinical features or the signs and symptoms of COVID-19? So the most prominent one, the typical features would be fever, cough and breathing difficulty. The various clinical features which have been reported from the China experience, from whatever cases were there, so there is a range of signs and symptoms. It ranges from fever, cough, fatigue, sputum, breathing difficulty, body aches and pains, sore throat, chills, vomiting or diarrhea. Now the COVID-19 versus other common conditions. How the signs and symptoms vary? So if we take a look at this table, what we see is the most common features in COVID-19 would be fever, dry cough and dyspnea, which is not so in case of common cold. Headaches, aches and pains, these are common in flu but not really in COVID-19. So throat, runny nose, etc. are not as common as in the conditions like flu. How severe is this condition that is COVID-19? So that spectrum of illness can range from mild to critical. The mild cases account for up to 81% of the cases. The 14% cases would be severe, that is those cases having hypoxia, more than 50% lung involvement on imaging within 24 to 48 hours. That can be seen in 14% of the cases. And critical disease can be noticed in cases up to 5%. That is th those who are involved involving respiratory failure, show multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. What are the risk factors for COVID-19? So who are the people at higher risk for the severe illness? People who are aged 65 years and above, people living in nursing homes or in the long-term facilities, people with comorbid conditions such as respiratory diseases or cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, those who are having malignancy or immunocompromised systems, and pregnant women, they also need monitoring. What are the predictors of the poor prognosis? The demographic factors, that is age of the individual, more the age, more the uh, poorer the prognosis. In individuals who are older than 80 years, 15% of the fatality can be seen. Male gender is particularly at a risk of poor prognosis. Presence of the underlying conditions, medical conditions, diabetes, immunosuppression, etc. 
those are also prognostic of poor conditions, poor outcomes. Lab findings like such as elevated white blood cell count, creatinine, which is elevated, uh, C-reactive proteins, LDH, severe lymphopenia. These are also indicators of poor prognosis. Now, there are certain case definitions that we ought to be aware about. Like who is a suspect case? A patient with acute respiratory illness and a history of travel to or residence in a location reporting community transmission of COVID-19 disease during the 14 days prior to symptom onset or a patient with any acute respiratory illness and having been in contact with a confirmed or probable COVID-19 case in the last 14 days prior to symptom onset or even a patient with severe acute respiratory illness and requiring hospitalization and in the absence of an alternative diagnosis that fully explains the clinical presentation. What are the probable cases? A suspect case for whom testing for the COVID-19 virus is inconclusive or a suspect case for whom testing could not be performed for any reason. What is a confirmed case? A person with lab confirmation of COVID-19 infection, irrespective of clinical signs and symptoms. Contact would be a person who experienced any one of the following exposures during the previous two days before and the 14 days after the onset of the symptoms of a probable or confirmed case. Note that for confirmed asymptomatic cases, the period of contact is measured as the two days before through the 14 days after the date on which the sample was taken, which led to confirmation. Now for diagnosis, how to go about it? Definitive diagnosis of COVID-19 is possible only and only with the microbiologic testing. Confirmed case, a person with lab confirmation of virus causing COVID-19, irrespective of clinical signs and symptoms, shows this statement. SARS, Coronavirus 2 RNA is detected by reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction that is RT-PCR as a mnemonic. Regional and local health departments, they may have specific guidelines for its testing. The priority ought to be given to individuals who are hospitalized, who are with higher exposure risk, who are symptomatic with risk for poorer outcomes. Why to do this testing? So the revised strategy of COVID-19 testing in India has been, the guidelines are given by ICMR. The aim is to contain the spread of the infection and to provide reliable diagnosis to all the individuals. So all individuals need not be tested because disease is primarily reported in those individuals with travel history to the affected countries or the close contact of the positive cases. So whom to test? That is the moot question. All those symptomatic people who have undertaken international travel in last 14 days, who had come in contact with lab confirmed cases, who are healthcare workers or who are hospitalized patients with severe acute respiratory illness or as they call it as SARI. Asymptomatic direct and high risk contacts of a confirmed case should also be tested once between day 5 and day 14 of coming in the contact. Patients who meet the criteria for testing should undergo testing for SARS coronavirus 2 and also respiratory pathogens. Recommendations for sample collection as per ICMR, nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs are the preferred method for diagnosis. Clinician may also collect lower respiratory tract samples if these are readily available. Use appropriate uh, PPEs for specimen collection, like droplet and contact precautions need to be observed in case of upper respiratory tract infections or airborne precautions for lower respiratory tract specimens. Additional specimens such as blood, stool and urine can also be collected to rule out alternative supportive diagnosis. The viral swabs should be sterile Dacron or rayon based, not cotton based and viral transport media also should be used. How to collect the nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs? For nasopharyngeal swabbing, tilt the patient's head back by about 70 degrees. Insert the flexible swab through the nails parallel to the palate until the resistance is encountered. 
or the distance is equivalent to that from the ear to the nostril of the patient. Gently rub and roll the swab. Leave the swab in place for several seconds to absorb the secretions before removing the swab. For oropharyngeal swab, tilt the patient's head back by 70 degrees. Rub swab over both tonsillar pillars and posterior oropharynx and avoid touching the tongue, teeth and gums. Use only synthetic fiber swabs with plastic shafts. Place swabs immediately into sterile tubes containing 2 to 3 ml of the viral transport media. Now these are the guidelines laid down for specimen collection, packaging and transport guidelines for 2019 novel coronavirus. The requirements for clinical sample collection, packaging and transport would be sample vials and virus transport media, adsorbent materials such as cotton, tissue paper, paraffin, scissors, cellotape, etc., a leak-proof secondary containers, hard frozen gel packs for transportation, a suitable outer container. These things need to be prepared before starting with the specimen collection. What is the procedure for specimen uh, packaging and transport? So for this, use the personal protective equipment while handling the specimen. Seal the neck of the sample vials using parafilms appropriately. Cover the sample vials using adsorbent material. Arrange primary containers appropriately. Place the centrifuge tubes inside a Ziploc pouch. Place the Ziploc pouch in turn inside a sturdy plastic container and seal the neck of the container. Using a thermocol box as an outer container and placing the secondary container within it, surrounded by hard frozen gel packs. Use a hard cardboard box as an outer container and placing the secondary container and the gel packs. Place the completed specimen referral form which is nowadays available online and generally the patients would have filled in already. Securing the Ziploc pouch with the specimen referral form on the outer container. Now, in India, ICMR approved labs facilities are available for testing. Both government labs are there and private labs are there. In total, the government uh, labs will be about 122, out of which 113 are operational and the rest are under operationalization. In Delhi, we have six such labs. The private labs in total all over the country are 47 and in Delhi, we have eight labs. So for the diagnosis of COVID-19, rapid tests are also available, but there is no definitive evidence regarding the utility of these uh, tests. Then uh, chest radiography, for that the findings are not specific normal in initial phases or mild cases. Bilateral infil infiltrates may be seen in the chest radiography. So chest radiography and CT scan is not really recommended because in these cases the patient may have to be moved and which can be a source of uh, infection. Then uh, pulmonary function test is also not advisable because there is a risk for cross infection and hence it should be avoided. Other lab investigations. Lymphopenia, it is most common, elevated LDH, ferritin levels, and aminotransferase. That also can be done. Elevated HGOT, SGPT levels is also common in these cases. Elevated urea creatinine is possible. Other investigations, as in severe pneumonia, like blood culture, sputum endotracheal aspirate cultures, or union uh, urine, uh, legionella antigen also may have to be tested. COVID-19 is a new disease caused by new coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2. Primarily, it is a zoonotic disease which is prevalent in bats, pangolins, camels, cattle, etc. It is transmitted from bats to humans and probably later the evidence might suggest otherwise. Human to human transmission is predominantly happening through droplets and fomites or that is the articles which are used by the positive cases. Elderly and having comorbidities are at a high risk. Common symptoms include fever, dry cough, and breathing difficulty. Reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction is the confirmatory diagnostic test. So, 
COVID-19 is an evolving and dynamic condition. We need to understand that. There are large gaps in our understanding about several aspects of COVID-19. The natural history of COVID-19 is still not yet fully understood. Therefore, careful consideration and prioritization is suggested for optimum use of the scarce resources. Further studies are needed to understand the entire natural history and the evidence for treatment, etc. Thank you. Today, we will be discussing about what is COVID-19, its epidemiology, the mode of transmission, how contagious or fatal COVID-19 is, how, what are some of the clinical features, how to diagnose COVID-19. So, coronavirus comprises of a large family of viruses, including about seven, seven strains that are common in human beings as well as amongst the animals. These cause illnesses ranging from common cold to more severe diseases, such as severe acute respiratory syndrome, as to while SARS, coronavirus, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS coronavirus, novel coronavirus 219. It is a new strain not identified in humans earlier. Coronaviruses are genotic, that is, they can be transmitted between animals and human beings. These might include SARS coronavirus, which is transmitted from the civet cats to the humans, uh, Middle East uh, respiratory syndrome, MERS coronavirus, which is transmitted from the camels to the human beings and several other coronaviruses circulating in animals, but, we, but which are not yet infected humans. Now, SARS coronavirus epidemic that happened way back in the year 2002-2003, it caused a large scale devastation beginning in originating in China in November 2002. It affected over 8,000 persons and led to almost 8,800 deaths in 26 countries. MERS coronavirus 2012 began in Saudi Arabia with approximately 2,500 cases and 800 deaths. And still, it causes some sporadic cases now and then. So on 31st of December 2019, WHO China country office informed of the cases of pneumonia of unknown etiology in Wuhan city in the Hubei province of China. 7th January 2020, uh, 2019, an, an novel coronavirus was identified as a positive agent by Chinese authorities. The new virus was designated as Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, that is SARS Coronavirus 2. On 11th February 2020, WHO named the new coronavirus disease as COVID-19. 30th January 2020. Hello everyone, today we shall be learning about infection prevention and control while managing COVID-19 patients. We all know that COVID is potentially fatal disease and it is of a global public health concern. WHO has already declared it as an emergency. The purpose of this webinar is to brush up our knowledge related to infection control and prevention with regard to management of COVID-19 patients. Today, I'm proposing to follow this outline. We'll be talking about coronavirus, the risk of COVID-19 among healthcare professionals, transmission of COVID-19 among healthcare personnel, protecting healthcare professionals from COVID-19 using standard precautions, respiratory and contact precautions, in case of accidental exposure, what is to be done by the healthcare professional? Patient assessment and placement and how to ensure that patient is isolated and barrier nursing is provided. In case if healthcare professional has a contact with the positive patient, then whom to contact for the services? And finally, I'll conclude 
with some take home message. To start with, coronavirus belongs to a family of viruses that causes illness ranging from common cold to more severe diseases. A novel coronavirus, it's a new strain that has not been previously identified in human beings. There has been human to human transmission. Now the question arises, are healthcare professionals at risk? Yes, healthcare professionals can be at risk. They can be at risk of acquiring the infection through respiratory route and direct contact with infectious patients. How does COVID-19 spread? It is from human to human, from person to person via respiratory droplet infection. That is the primary mode of transmission followed by close contact and this close contact can occur while caring for a patient including being within approximately six feet that is two meters of a patient within COVID-19 for a prolonged period of time having direct contact with infectious secretions such as sputum, serum, blood and respiratory droplets of a patient with COVID-19. If close contact occurs while not wearing all the recommended personal protective equipment. Again, a very big question is there in front of us, how to protect ourselves as healthcare professionals how can we protect ourselves from COVID-19? We have to follow the standard recommendations, which includes standard precautions, respiratory precautions, and contact precautions, so as to prevent infection spread from patients to the healthcare personnel. Let's see what the standard precautions are. We all are familiar with the standard precautions, these are the set of interventions carried out by healthcare professionals while taking care of infected patient. Healthcare workers caring for patients under investigations or confirmed cases should implement standard infection control precautions, which include observing basic hygiene, use of personal protective equipment, respiratory etiquette, maintaining environmental cleaning and disinfection, biomedical waste management, and finally, safe handling of dead bodies. So let us see one by one. So we start with hand hygiene. We all know that hand hygiene is one of the most simplest and cost effective method of controlling the spread of infection. Hand hygiene can be performed using soap and water or alcohol-based hand rub. We should perform hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water before and after all patients contact, contact with potentially infectious material and before putting on and upon removal of personal protective equipment including gloves. Remember, whenever our hands are visibly soiled, we need to wash with soap and water not with the alcohol rub. So hand hygiene should be performed immediately after contact with the respiratory secretions and as and when you feel that you have touched the patient or the patient's belongings which act as fomites. The second important component of standard precautions is referring to the use of personal protective equipment. Healthcare workers, they are involved in direct patient care. They should make use of the following PPE, that is the gowns, gloves, medical mask, eye protection, including goggles or face shield. Selection of personal protective equipment should be done very carefully, considering the nature of activities we are involved in. For example, we are performing aerosolized procedures where the aerosols are likely to get generated, for example, endotracheal suctioning, while giving bag and mask ventilation, while providing non-invasive ventilation, or during bronchoscopy when we are assisting. As nurses, when we are assisting for bronchoscopic procedures, there we have to make use of 
the personal protective equipment and then uh, we have to also perform hand hygiene before putting on and after taking off PPE. Discard PPE in appropriate waste container after use. So use of personal protective equipment is decided depending upon whether you are involved in direct patient care or you are there as an ancillary staff, what type of procedure you are doing, which type of setting you are working in. For example, if you are working in the emergency department, ICU or ward, there you have to make use of particulate respirator like N95. While in screening areas or in the OPD, one can still manage with the three layer surgical mask. There are number of steps involved while doning and doffing the personal protective equipment. So there are nine steps involved in wearing the personal protective equipment while 19 steps are involved in removal of personal protective equipment. So one has to be very very careful while do doning as well as doffing the PPE. In between hand hygiene is recommended between the two steps like when you are removing your mask and between removal of goggles or gowns or gloves it is recommended to maintain the hand hygiene. Use of double gloves is recommended when you are in contact with COVID-19 patients. Then there are transmission based precautions to be observed. There are mainly of two types, respiratory precautions and contact precautions. Respiratory precautions, let us discuss in detail how we can ensure the respiratory precautions. Wear a medical mask while entering a room where the patient suspected or confirmed of being infected with Corona-19 are admitted. Use a particulate respirator like N95, gloves and gowns aprons when performing aerosolized gener generating procedures such as tracheal intubation, non-invasive ventilation, tracheostomy, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, manual ventilation before intubation and while assisting for bronchoscopy. Environmental cleaning and disinfection is considered to be an integral part of the standard precautions. We have to emphasize on routine cleaning and disinfection procedures as appropriate in the healthcare settings. Only the intensity and frequency is to be increased. In the areas like laundry, food services, we have to manage the laundry, food services and utensil in accordance with routine procedures. In environmental cleaning, the person whosoever is involved in the process of environment cleaning should ensure that personal protective equipment are on. Cleaning agents and disinfectants like 1% sodium hypochlorite solution can be prepared. Usually we have 5% sodium hypochlorite solution available. This can be reduced to the strength of 1% by diluting 200 ml of sodium hypochlorite with 800 ml of water. The solution should be prepared fresh. If you are using a long-standing solution, it is likely to lose its potency. So ensure that the solution which is prepared for the cleaning purpose is freshly prepared and it should be covered. Otherwise, there would be escape of fluorine gas and therefore making the sodium hypochlorite solution ineffective. Leave the solution for a contact time of at least 10 minutes. There are certain surfaces where the use of bleaching powder or the bleaching agent is not recommended, such as metals. So in those surface areas, alcohol, that is either isopropyl alcohol 70%, or ethyl alcohol 70% can be used to wipe down the surfaces. There are some cleaning guidelines. First of all, we have to ensure that the area where the cleaning is going to take place is sealed off. So seal off the areas where the confirmed case has visited before carrying out cleaning and disinfection. 
mopping the floor with routinely available deodorizing agents like phenyl or 1% hypochlorite disinfectant solution can be used. Wipe down all accessible surfaces of wall as well as the blinds with bleach solution. Discard cleaning items into biohazard bags. Disinfect buckets. The buckets which were used for the cleaning purpose should be disinfected by soaking in 1% hypochlorite or bleach solution. Dispose of the waste generated as a result of cleaning into biohazard bags. Cleaning staff should be attired in suitable personal protective equipment. This is something very, very essential and mandatory. Regarding decontamination and biomedical waste management, disinfect any surface or material known to be or potentially be contaminated. We have to identify and segregate contaminated material before decontamination and or disposal as biomedical waste guidelines. Where contamination has occurred but the process of decontamination is not possible like the laboratory, we need to package the contaminated waste for transfer to another facility with decontamination capacity. So while decontaminating the equipments and the waste and the biomedical waste generated as a result of patient care, one has to ensure that heavy duty gloves are put on along with disposable long sleeve gown, eye goggles or a face shield and a medical mask. Now coming to contact precautions, the contact transmission between an infected or colonized person and a susceptible host can be through direct contact, either it is body to body surface or it can be indirect through fomites. So all the patient's belongings, the patient care items present in the patient care unit, they can act as fomites. Contact precautions can be observed by ensuring frequent hand hygiene, making use of personal protective equipments and decontaminating the items more frequently. Here I would like to say that there are two types of surfaces available, low touch areas and the high touch areas. High touch, high touch areas are required to be cleaned more frequently. Again, we have clinical areas and non-clinical areas. So in clinical areas, maybe every one to two hourly, the high touch areas like the the door handle, the switches, buttons, knobs of the monitor, they can be cleaned more frequently like one to two hours. While in non-clinical areas like uh, the laboratory, uh, there the frequency of cleaning can be every three to four hours. Finally, handling the dead bodies. When handling of dead bodies, is concerned, we have to avoid direct contact with blood or body fluids from the dead body. Put on personal protective equipment. Make sure that if healthcare professional has any wounds, cuts or abrasions, they are covered with waterproof bandage or dressings. We are not supposed to be eating, drinking or smoking near the dead body. Do not touch your eyes, mouth or nose. Obstruct, oh, sorry, observe strict personal and hand hygiene. Avoid sharp injuries which can occur during the course of examination of dead body and decontamination. Remove personal protective equipment after handling of the dead body. Wash hands with liquid soap and water immediately. In case of accidental exposure to blood and body fluids, for example, it's a percutaneous injury or a mucocutaneous exposure, one has to wash the site thoroughly with soap and water. For example, if the splash is in the eye, then we need to wash the site with copious amount of water. If it is 
percutaneous type of injury, there we need to thoroughly wash it with soap and water. All such incidents of percutaneous or mucocutaneous exposures are to be reported and we have to immediately seek the medical advice. When we have a patient coming to us in the triage area or in the ward or ICU, how we are going to assess a patient for COVID-19? First of all, we have to take history and identify if in the past 14 days since the first onset of symptoms, a history of either travel to epidemic area or close contact with a person known to have COVID-19 illness and the person has fever or symptoms of lower respiratory illness such as cough, shortness of breath. Along with this person can have cough, dryness of uh, oral cavity leading to progressive cough, fatigue, malice and later on some kind of GI symptoms such as vomiting and diarrhea can also be noticed. So if both exposure and illness are present and confirmed by the laboratory test, we need to isolate the patient. These patients should have the face mask on them. Isolate the patient in a private or a separate room. Wear appropriate personal protective equipment while providing care to these patients. Continue to assess their clinical status and provide appropriate treatment. Assess and triage patients with acute respiratory symptoms and risk factors for COVID-19 so as to minimize the chances of exposure. So the patients who are reporting with acute respiratory symptoms or some risk factors, they are to be immediately triaged and they should be placed in an isolated area. Make them put on the face mask and place them in the examination room with the closed door in an airborne infection isolation room if available. Now we move on to the nursing care. While providing nursing care to these patients, we have to observe barrier nursing. Barrier nursing is a special kind of nursing provided to the patient so as to protect the healthcare professionals from acquiring the infection with which patient has got admitted and further preventing the spread of infection from one person to another person. The patient under investigation or a confirmed case has to be admitted in an isolation room with negative pressure and at least 6 to 10 air exchanges should take place per hour. Only the essential personnel should enter the room. We need to restrict the entry of all the healthcare professionals present in the ward or ICU. Only few dedicated personnel should be allowed to enter the room. Make use of dedicated or disposable non-critical patient care equipment such as thermometers, blood pressure cuffs, saturation monitoring probes, etc. If the equipment is to be used for more than one patient, clean and disinfect such equipment before use on another patient according to the manufacturer's instructions. Healthcare personnel while entering the room or soon after a person or a patient when vacates the room should continue to use respiratory protection. So the healthcare personnel entering the room soon after a patient vacates the room should use respiratory protection. Few words about the safety of healthcare professionals. Many times it can happen the personal protective equipment loses its integrity, it's torn or it is not properly used by the healthcare professionals. In such situation, we have to seek the medical help. 
when to contact the occupational health services. We have to contact the occupational health services in case of unprotected exposure that is not wearing or inappropriately using the recommended PPE. To a confirmed or a possible COVID-19 patient, contact supervisor or occupational health services immediately. So whenever there is a history of unprotected exposure by any healthcare personnel, the person has to contact the supervisor or the occupational health services immediately. If one develops symptoms consistent with COVID-19, such as fever, cough, or difficulty in breathing, don't report to work and should contact the occupational health services. So finally, there is a take home message for the healthcare professionals. The nurses and the doctors, they are the frontline soldiers to fight a battle against COVID-19. We have to ensure that the protective measures are used. Take protective measures in workplace, learn properly how to use the PPE, doning of PPE as well as doffing of PPE is essential so as to protect oneself from getting sick. Encourage all the members of healthcare team to take protective measures. This is a time to remain calm and composed and encourage all the healthcare team members to observe the personal protective measures, the safety measures, the standard measures, universal precautions and transmission based precautions. So with this, I conclude uh, this webinar. This is the list of references uh, from which the material was prepared. Thank you. Hello everyone. Today we shall be learning about infection prevention and control while managing COVID-19 patients. We all know that COVID is Hello everyone, I am Jacinta Gunjial Sinte, an infection control nurse at AIMS Trauma Center. Compliance and adherence to infection prevention and control is paramount need of the hour for the frontline healthcare provider who are attending patients infected with coronavirus. This video will demonstrate to you the wearing or calm donning of PPE. Thank you. This video demonstrates the wearing or donning of personal protective equipment for attending COVID patients. The healthcare worker should attend to personal needs such as using the restroom and hydration before donning PPE. The healthcare worker is in a designated donning area. Their personal scrub and footwear. No personal items such as jewelry, watches, cell phones should be brought into the patient room. Ensure hair is pulled back away from the face and your nails clipped so that they do not puncture your gloves. The infection control nurse will assist the proper wearing of PPE and verify successful compliance. She will read aloud each step in the donning procedure checklist and visually confirm and document that the step is completed successfully. Now inspect your PPE. Check for any tear and wear and select appropriate size. Now perform hand hygiene with alcohol based hand rub. Next, sit in the chair and wear the inner shoe cover. This kit comes with two types of shoe covers. The inner shoe cover is permeable and shorter.
The outer shoe cover is not permeable to blood and body fluids and is longer and should be put above the inner shoe cover. Now perform hand hygiene. Next, we have the first pair of gloves. It should be smaller than the second pair and should be of comfortable size. Pull the sleeves as far as possible to cover your bare arms. Now, wear the gown. Take assistance of an infection control nurse in this step. Do not remove the pepper strip attached at the end of lace. It will be required while tying lace at the end. Identify the end of lace by attached pepper card. Remove the pepper card and tie the lace at the side of the waist snugly without wrapping all around the waist. Now, the infection control nurse will check for the fitness of the gown. Now, wear the N95 mask. To do this, hold the mask in your hand with the inner side of mask facing towards your face. Put on the mask by placing the lower strap behind the neck. The strap should be in contact with skin. Then place the upper strap over back of head. On sides, straps should be above the ear. Fit the mask snugly over the face by pressing the metal part over bridge of nose. Check for snug fit of mask by blowing air inside the mask. Air leak will be noted if the fit is improper. Next, wear hood. In this kit, the hood comes attached with a breather. Wear the breather mask attached with the hood the same way you wore the N95 mask. By placing the lower strap over the neck and the upper strap above the ears. The hood should lie over the gown covering the upper part of the body. Now wear the second pair of gloves larger than the first pair. The second pair of gloves should cover the free end of arms of gown. Now perform gown fitness check. Take help of an infection control nurse for fitness check and easy mobility. Infection control nurse gives clearance for leaving the donning area. Now we are going to show you the removal or doffing off of contaminated personal protective equipment which is to be done in a designated area. Doffing off must be done methodically, slowly and carefully to prevent generation of aerosols. This video will now demonstrate the proper technique of doffing off. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I hope you have uh, seen all three sessions. Now we'll take questions for the first session that is on uh, epidemiology. So the questions are, Dr. Kamlesh Sharma will read the questions and also give you the answers. Please read the question first. Hello. Good afternoon. So the first question is, does frequent gargling help in case of COVID-19? Now, this is a very often asked question. Uh, my answer to this would be that it is a soothing exercise, but it cannot be treated as a curative uh, or therapeutic measure. So it can be used as a supportive measure in case of COVID positive cases. Second question. Uh, the second question is with regard to the mode of transmission. Is COVID-19 airborne disease? So mainly, I would say it is a droplet and uh, it is transmitted through the droplet and uh, fomites. But in some selective specific conditions, like for example, if somebody is carrying out the procedure of bronchoscopy or doing the tracheal toileting, suctioning, aspiration, etc., there are chances of aerosol generation. So in that case, those people who are around the patient while doing this kind of procedures, they need to be extra cautious and need to use all the preventive measures. Third question. The next question is with regard to the spread in our country, that is in India, uh, considering the level of spread that is happening, what public education has to be focused on? So to my mind, the main focus should be on social distancing, on hand hygiene, on uh, for the, like in case there are suspected cases or confirmed cases, it is always better to focus on the isolation and quarantine practices in these conditions. The next question. There is another question with regard to source of COVID, the animal source of COVID. So as in the video you would have uh, seen, there are broadly two modes of transmission uh, which are considered right now as per the evidence available. One is from animals to human beings and the other is from uh, man to man or person to person. So the animals which are uh, considered uh, in the initially, it was thought that uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was the snakes and thereafter, whatever evidence is available or on epidemiological investigation in China in the Wuhan case, so that has shown that most probably it is the bats, considering their genetic makeup. And the other animal that is in that is also being considered as a source of for COVID infection is pangolins, which are mainly found in African and Asian countries. Another question is with regard to the stages of COVID-19. So what are the stages of COVID-19? There are broadly three stages. In stage one, we could say that the cases are mostly from the affected countries, and this happens amongst the travelers. When the travelers return, so local transmission may happen of these positive cases, and that would be stage two. India happens to be, as per the experts from the ICMR, India happens to be in that particular stage now, that is stage two. Stage three is when the disease spreads in communities, large areas are affected, and many times we are not uh, able to find out what are the contacts and from where the infection has been contracted. Stage four, the disease becomes out of proportion when there, there are large number of 
cases happening over a geographical area like in an epidemic there is no clear end point and Italy and China these countries are right now in stage three stage four so as I said that is Italy and China these two countries are in that stage right now there was another question with regard to the incubation period for what during incubation period for how long a person would be infected and there was another question with regard to the total incubation period. So as of the information available so far, it is seen that the uh, incubation period ranges somewhere from 2 to 14 days. But there could be a median period of another 5 days after the exposure. Some experts rather say it can be up to 21 days. Then uh, how long a person would be infected? Uh, how many people uh, a person can infect during the incubation period so there are two things here uh, this person can infect more uh, individuals during when the disease is more severe and on an average one individual is presumed to be in, uh, able to infect another 2.8 individuals that is three persons there was another question with regard to the care providers if someone or a healthcare provider who is having mild to moderate asthma can this uh, healthcare provider look after the covid positive cases now the answer could be yes and no in case the person is having active disease probably no unless it is under control even then it would be advisable to consult the treating physician then uh, the other question is pertaining to the main symptoms. In the video, I have discussed with regard to the uh, prominent uh, symptoms, sign symptoms, and also some of the other symptoms which are not so uh, frequent. So the major sign symptoms which are seen so far are fever, dry cough, and breathing difficulty. There can be other, some others have reported uh, like rhinodia, or it could be headaches, it could be even loss of smell, loss of taste, etc. Another question was pertaining to the death rate. How much is the fatality of COVID-19? So it ranges somewhere between 2.5 to 5 percent. On an average, 3.4 percent. That has been seen to be the case fatality rate in case of COVID-19. Incubation period, I have already said. So one more question was pertaining to the mode of transmission okay, whether it can be transmitted through the stools and if not then why to test do the urine and stool testing now first of all there is no uh, adic not adequate evidence with regard to the transmission through the stools uh, covid 19 the, uh, vi this virus has been uh, isolated from the stools but it is not clear whether it is able to transmit the in, uh, infection in adequate amounts or not or in like considerable amounts or not so, so further studies are required in this direction that is why it is always suggested it is better that one does the hand hygiene after uh, the toileting or after uh, defecation etc and also before eating the meals or touching the meals one more question was with regard to how much of the temperature can be temperature range can be there in the people who are having COVID-19 infection or disease. So this temperature can range somewhere 38 to 39 degree centigrade in general. So these were some of the uh, important <coughs> questions that were asked. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Kamlesh Sharma. Now we go to the second uh, lecture. So Dr. Poonam. Joshi will answer your questions regarding uh, infection control practices. Thank you, Dr. Sandhya Gupta. Uh, the questions uh, which have been raised uh, while watching the webinar are very pertinent and uh, I'm very happy to answer them. Uh, let's start with the questions. The first question was, why should we wash our hands while being at home? So this is the first question uh, one of our uh, audience they have asked this question uh, here I would like to say that along with social distancing the hand washing is also important in containing and curtailing the infection we all know that 
we are touching four mites, whether we are working in the patient care area or we are at home, we are coming in contact with many people in our day-to-day -day interaction. So these are the two ways by which we can minimize the spread of infection. So please encourage in your family as well as in your workplace to wash your hands more frequently. And this was discussed in detail how frequently we have to wash, when we have to wash. Remember the five movements of hand hygiene which we have been practicing. But now with, with view, in view of the COVID-19 infection, we have to ensure that we continue to comply with the hand hygiene practices. One question was related to the role of hydroxychloroquine in management of uh, COVID-19. Here I would like to say that uh, there, so far there are uh, um, there is no treatment available. Whatever treatment is provided is purely symptomatic and supportive. So we should not take hydroxychloroquine tablet on our own. The best thing would be to seek the medical advice. Whenever you feel that you, while taking care of patient, you have developed some symptoms, please seek the support from the healthcare services which are available for the healthcare professionals. And whatever they advise, just follow them. It is always good to quarantine yourself in case of presence of symptoms. Another question was related to the use of masks. How long safely we can make use of one mask? Here I would like to say that masks can be comfortably worn for three to four hours till the time you do not feel it becoming moist. Or whenever you feel your mask has got spoiled or soiled due to some uh, uh, aerosolized uh, generating uh, procedures, that time you can change your mask more frequently. In the healthcare setting, when we are working in the ward or in the ICU, ensure that you have N95 mask for your use because this is the one which is considered to be the best. While in the screening area, one can still continue with the three layer mask, the ordinary surgical mask which is available. But in the ward, in the emergency and in the ICU, one cannot work without having N95 mask. Remember, you can change it every three to four hours or whenever you find it becoming moist. Another question was related to the use of hand hygiene. Hand hygiene uh, is maintained using soap and water as well as using the alcohol rubs available in the patient care areas. All the alcohol rubs contain around 68 to 70% of isopropyl alcohol in it. Therefore, they are considered to be the best in killing the coronavirus. Another question was related to the, the, uh, related to the virus. How long does it remain uh, alive in the air? So this question has been already answered by uh, my colleague, Dr. Kamlesh Sharma. The virus can be alive in the air, maybe for a period of three hours, while on fomites, you will find like uh, cardboard boxes for 24 hours, on metal and plastic, shiny objects, it may last for 42 to 72 hours. So please do take the precautions and get them periodically clean in your ICU, either using hypochlorite solution or with isopropyl alcohol. Use of hypochlorite solution on metal surfaces, surfaces is not appropriate. But definitely on plastic and on tabletops, hypochlorite is the best way to take care of coronavirus. How to disinfect phone? This was another question raised by one of the audience. So the phone, since it is a plastic body, can be safely treated with 1% hypochlorite solution. Allow the solution to come in contact with the, the fomite, any fomite, not only the phone, any fomite in, with which you are coming in contact with, allow it to be in touch with hypochlorite solution. You have to literally wipe the surface with a wet mop containing hypochlorite solution and allow the contact to be there for 10 minutes. Allow it to dry on its own. That will take care of the coronavirus. Early diagnosis is possible. This was the question by 
it was a suggestion as well as a question how early a diagnosis is possible so any person who is suspected to have any of the disease symptoms which were narrated by dr kamlesh sharma that uh, can uh, that type of person can report to the healthcare facility and get herself or himself uh, investigated usually the pharyngeal and the nasal swabs are taken to confirm the diagnosis the contacts are also subjected to this kind of test one more question was related to the extra essential precautions used for covid-19 yes we do have to take extra precautions while working in the icu in the ward as well as in emergency maybe the concept of double gloves is very true as far as coronavirus or covid-19 is concerned but if you are working in the screening area the, the double use of gloves is not at all recommended so your decision regarding the use of ppe depends upon the site where you are working whether it is a ward or an icu or an opd the type of nursing activity you are involved in and the type of contact with uh, you have with the patient whether you are the healthcare person like doctor or a nurse or you are an ancillary staff ancillary staff since they are not coming in direct contact with the patient they can continue with uh, the ordinary uh, triple layer mask while uh, the healthcare persons the technical staff doctors and nurses they should only be using n95 masks so finally i would like to say prevention is the only way to control the infection please learn how to make use of ppe this is little different what we were doing routinely in our day to day patient care activity because covid is a covid 19 is a very fatal disease and is likely to be very fatal uh, approximately having a mortality of around uh, uh, 3 to 5% so one has to be very very careful uh, i hope uh, uh, you have learned a lot from uh, uh, the videos which you watched uh, during this webinar and uh, now finally i would like to conclude that as healthcare professionals our duty is also to educate the public so please encourage all the healthcare professionals as well as your family members to continue washing your hands washing their hands more frequently and maintaining the social distance if we all work together we will be definitely able to fight against this war thank you now we'll take the third session Madam Jacinta will answer your questions on PPE, and very soon we'll show you the video once again because the doffing could not be seen by many. So we'll show you the video again. But meanwhile, we'll answer the questions related to PPE, Madam Jacinta, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sandhya, ma'am. The the first question I would like to take in terms of the video which you have seen, and uh, before I take the question, I'd like to. Um, make it clear that there are different types of ppe that is available so the one we showed you is which comes with a hood and there are and this comes under surgical and which is available at ends so there was a question which asked for why don't we upload the video in the you know ends website i think this will be done soon and um, and this there will be many video which would be coming in terms of donning or uh, wearing of ppe because as i have said there are different types of ppe this is under surgical there's something called kyvex so many thing you will see but the important point here is no matter what kind of ppe you have the important point here is when you wear your ppe you should be fully fully covered and fully protected and there was another question that is asked can n95 mask be used beyond 24 hours so i think this answer should remain with you because it will depend on how you use your n95 mask and who the person is using if it is for social preventive measures and you are using it in a non clinical setting i think it is better to use plus you do not have cough call 
kind of symptoms, then I would say you can use up to 24 hours. Again, for N95 mask being used in a clinical setting where you have COVID patients, it should not be used beyond four to six hours. That is one shift because it is not yet clear as of now how long a nurse would be doing the shift. So during the shift, if there are no visible contaminations or kind of any wear and tear in your mask, you would be changing that N95 mask, otherwise you still can use it. And there is one question that asks for why two sets of footwear and two sets of gloves. Now is the time that calls for double protection. So a healthcare worker has to be fully protected, extra careful. So therefore we suggest that you can use your the, the double gloves so that in case you have, you know, visibly soil contamination in your glove, at least you can remove your outer gloves. And still they uh, um, hoping that your inner gloves is intact so that you can still wear on another outer gloves. And um, again, also for the shoe cover, it applies the same because you are going to work on that shoe cover during your whole shift. So in case even the outer shoe cover breaks, which is non-permeable to body and blood and body fluids, so you are double protected because the whole aim is here now to protect you, keep you safe because your service in serving the COVID patient is paramount. Yeah, very, very important person now. Therefore, it is the responsibility of all healthcare provider that we protect ourselves first so that we can protect the others. So with this, I think yes, I'm going to end the question and I thank you. And also we'll show you the both the video, so both the videos once again, please, stay with us. Stay with yeah, us. please stay with us. So we'll start the video, please stay with us, and we'll wait for your queries. Yeah, take questions Hello everyone, I'm Jacinta Gunjial Sinte, an infection control nurse at AIMS Trauma Center. Compliance and adherence to infection. Make sure hand rub in PPE. In case the, the doffing room should have a chair, but demonstrate the steps for doffing or removing of personal pers Dopping off. Thank you. So generation of the soap native area. Now we are going to show you the removal or doffing off of contaminated personal protective equipment, which is to be done in a designated area. Doffing off must be done methodically, slowly, and carefully to prevent generation of aerosols. This video will now demonstrate the proper technique of doffing off. Thank you. The following video will demonstrate the steps for doffing or removing of personal protective equipment after completing your shift of duty in a COVID unit. You are in a designated doffing area. The doffing room should have a chair, biomedical waste bin, and automatic hand rub dispenser. First, engage the infection control nurse to instruct the doffing process and check for tear and exposed body parts in PPE. 
Now disinfect the outer gloves using an alcohol-based hand rub. Next, sit on the dirty chair. Remove the shoe covers by grasping the outer surface. Make sure your legs are apart and not touching each other. Disinfect the outer gloves. Now remove the outer gloves. Do this by holding your wrist facing your thumb upward towards the ceiling. Pinch the gloves, leave at wrist. Roll it down until it is completely off palm of the hand. Then slide your finger down inside the other hand and pull the gloves completely off your hands. Give special attention that you should not contaminate or tear the inner gloves. Do not snap the gloves which may cause spray or aerosol reduction. Inspect both sides of inner gloves. Next, perform hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand rub. Now we will remove the hood. To do this, grab the hood and straps of breather mask from outside with both hands. Pull it over and away from the body and discard. Disinfect the inner gloves. Next, remove the gown. First, release the tie, grasp at hip level and pull the gown down and away from the body. Once the gown is off your shoulder, pull one arm at a time from the sleeves of the gown. Arms are punched at your wrist. Then roll exposed side of gown inward until it is tight and discard. Disinfect the inner gloves. Remove making sure not to contaminate your hands. The process of removing the inner gloves is similar to outer gloves. Dispose the inner gloves. Perform hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand rub. Now put on a fresh pair of gloves. Now you are going to remove the N95 respirator. It is important that you do not touch the front of a respirator. First tilt your head forward and use two hands to grab the bottom strip, then pull the sides and over your head. Then use both hands to grab the upper strap, pull the sides and over your head. It is important not to touch in front of the respirator and dispose it. Perform hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand rub.
Remove your gloves. And perform hand hygiene. Turn around and let the infection control nurse inspect your scrubs for any tear or contamination. Before shower, change into a fresh pair of footwear and immerse the used pair into 1% sodium hypochlorite solution. Now, the healthcare worker will take head-to-toe shower and put on new scrubs before leaving the COVID unit. So thank you very much viewers. We'll be back tomorrow at 2 o'clock from 2 to 3.30 and whatever pending questions we'll try to cover tomorrow in the presentation. Thank you very much. Have a good day.